Morning everyone and thank you all for joining us early. Today we are hosting our webinar on the science behind our city in nature. My name is Xiaoqi and I'll be your host for today. Thank you for coming in early and we'll be waiting a few more minutes uh, to allow more participants to stream in. And we'll start the webinar at 10.30, 35 a.m. sharp. So um, while, we're, while you're waiting, um, do click on this QR code and you can you can actually watch a video on how um, MPAX explains what it means to be a city in nature. So do sit back and relax and enjoy the video uh, while we wait for the other participants to stream in. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on the science behind our city in nature. My name is Xiao Xi and I'll be your host for today. Joining me today are my colleagues, Mr. Dylan Ng, as well as Mr. Gervais Lee, and they'll be sharing with you how MPAS incorporates science and technology across many different fields um, that we are working on, such as biodiversity management, management of our trees, as well as our parks and our gardens. So thank you very much for joining us today, this Saturday morning. And we have a lot of interesting content as well as a lot of cool videos to share with you, with you guys. But before we start, let's get everyone warmed up by doing a short quiz on Mentimeter. Do scan the QR code that's shown on the screen, or you can also access the link that will be pasted in the Zoom chat. So um, do scan the link and then we'll wait for everyone to log into the Mentimeter before we start. And um, I will switch over the screen uh, once most of us are logged into Mentimeter. Yep, I really see some responses coming in. So um, I'll be switching over the screen so you can still click the Mentimeter using the link and I'll switch over to the screen now. So our first question is just to find out how our audience, how you guys doing feeling this morning. So hmm, it seems to be um, quite a diverse range of responses. We have some people that are feeling excited. That's good because <laughs> we have a lot of interesting content to share with you today. Oh, I think quite a lot of people are happy as well. Curious? That's good. That's good. Oh no, 14% of us are sleepy. Well, we hope that um, our content later, there's a lot of exciting videos as well as cute animations of cute um, uh, animals that will help to cheer you up. So we have to push you to the other bars, such as excited, happy or curious. So, oh, a lot of people are happy. <laughs> That's great. So um, we'll just switch over to the next question. It will be a word cloud. And we want to find out actually um, what is your favorite animal actually seen in Singapore? So do type in, um, there's a few options. Uh, you can give uh, more than one answer. So we like to see um, what kind of animal our audience actually likes to see in Singapore today. So do type in the chat and then we will uh, do type in in the Mentimeter and we'll see the responses. Pangolin, yes. <laughs> we'll actually be seeing a picture of a pangolin later in our <laughs> the voucher, yes. Hornbill, otters, birds. Oh, okay. Do keep the answer streaming. I think you can answer more than once. So um, let's see what other animals our audience has. Panda. Okay. <laughs> Raffles Bender Langer. Yes, we actually have a video later. Um, um, uh, my, my colleague Dylan will actually be sharing uh, with you some of the animations of the animals that we've actually captured on some of our camera traps. And some of these are um, will be featured later as well. Oh, pangolin seems to be the biggest. I guess a lot of people like the pangolins. That's great. Yeah. All right. Uh, that's great. Okay. I think. <laughs> wow, new <Nudie> branch. Awesome. <laughs> see stars. It's good to see that there's quite a mixture of um, both the fauna that's on living in terrestrial habitats as well as marine habitats. That's good. Blue coral snake, that's cool. <laughs> All right. Okay, that's, that's, that, that's really quite, it's great to see that there's such a diversity of um, animals that Singaporeans actually like to see in Singapore. And yes, a lot of them, um, it's actually great to see um, that there's a diversity of uh, fauna across both the marine as well as terrestrial habitats. So you guys can keep continue to um, contribute to the word cloud, but then now we'll switch over to the main deck um, where we'll be starting the main section of our presentation. So I'll be switching over to uh, the main deck now, but you can still continue to contribute your answers to the word cloud and um, see, and then at the end, we'll actually see like what's the most popular animal that people actually like to see in Singapore. So now I'll be switching over to the main deck and I hope the exercise got you guys a bit warmed up and a bit ready for today's webinar. So I would like to um, introduce my colleague. Um, first up, we will have Mr. Dylan Ng. He's from the National Biodiversity Center, specifically um, in the terrestrial region. And he'll be sharing with you how uh, MPAS is actually using science and technology in the management of our biodiversity in Singapore. Following which, he'll be handing the time over to Mr. Jerez Lee, who is the senior management manager from the Center for Urban Greenery and Ecology, and he'll be sharing with you how MPAS actually uses science and tech to actually manage 
the many, many different trees in, that we have here in Singapore, as well as the various parks um, that MParks manages. So now I would like to uh, hand the time over to Mr. Dylan to actually take over the presentation. Dylan, please. All right. Thanks, Xiaoqi, for the introduction. Uh, let me just get a control of the slides. Okay. Okay, hi, good morning everyone. So I'm Dylan from the National Biodiversity Center. So just a quick overview of today's content. Uh, so firstly, we'll be going through the science behind our city in nature. So how city in nature is grounded in a science-based approach. And after that, we will be going through how uh, city in nature harnesses digitalization and technology uh, in various parts, uh, aspects of our operations. So, so from tree management to park management, and also biodiversity management. So let me continue. So city nature is about restoring nature back into our city. So this can be uh, done by applying nature-based solutions towards achieving climate, uh, ecological, and social resilience. And these are some of our key strategies in becoming a city in nature. So one, we have, ex we have to extend our nat natural capital. Uh, two, intensify nature in our gardens and parks. Uh, three, restore nature into the urban landscape. And four, strengthen connectivity between our green spaces. So everyone has a role to play uh, in this journey towards becoming a city in nature. So let's dive right in into the science behind our city in nature. So to give a little more context uh, into this, this plan, so this is our nature conservation master plan, which is kind of by our blueprint. Uh, involves these four main pillars. So there's conservation of key habitats, uh, habitat enhancement, restoration, uh, and species recovery, uh, applied research and conservation biology and planning, and also community stewardship and outreach in nature. So I'm sure many of you have visited our nature reserves at least once. So the central catchment uh, seen from an uh, aerial view. So we also have Bukitima Nature Reserve, Swain Bolo, and Labrador Nature, uh, nature Reserve uh, in Singapore. So these different areas, core areas, are really important for biodiversity. So these are safeguarded under our nature reserves framework. And uh, they also provide really important ecosystem services and all of you can visit uh, them in your free time as well. And we also, also, okay, so I want to give you a kind of different perspective of our nature reserves. So there's Bukatima nature reserves uh, seen from the air. So what do you think this looks like to you? So I think uh, this, uh, to me, uh, these trees from the air actually look a lot like uh, broccoli trees. So uh, this is just some food for thought for you next time you visit Bukitima Nature Reserve. So other places you can visit in Singapore include uh, buffer areas. So these are the nature parks that we have in Singapore. So these are also really important. So they serve as complementary habitats for the flora and fauna that are in our nature reserves. So they also provide uh, nature-based recreation. So it means you can visit it uh, with your friends and family. So these are uh, some of the different nature parks that, you can, that we have in Singapore. So Dairy Farm, uh, Hint Heat Nature Park. Uh, and so one of the newer ones that we have is uh, Thompson Nature Park. So this actually opened in October, 2019. So I think uh, <laughs> this is a really great place to visit. So I've actually visited it and it's a good place to see Raffles van der Langers. And this is a overview of uh, Windsor Nature Park. So this actually opened uh, back in 2017. So some of you might know it by one of its more popular trails, which is uh, Venus Loop. So this is actually quite a popular spot for bird watching. So this is actually where I saw my first uh, Siberian blue robin and the forest wagtail uh, in one of the trails here. So actually you can also see uh, the blue robin parrot uh, feeding on the starfruit trees uh, when it's in season as well. So it's a great place to visit. And we also have the upcoming Mandai mangroves and mudflat nature park. So this is where you can see uh, different shorebirds from the boardwalk. Uh, and this forms part of the Swine Below Nature Park Network. So you can also visit other uh, other parks in the area, such as Swine Below, uh, Kranji Marshes, uh, where you can also see different types of shorebirds and waterbirds in the area. So to further improve the uh, ecological resilience uh, of the different habitats in Singapore, 
uh, it's also important to establish uh, connections between uh, different habitats. So the green arrows here you can see in a map uh, showcase the different types of connectivity uh, that connect between different core areas in Singapore. So there's Western Catchment, and you also have Central Catchment in the middle, and our South Islands and Labrador Nature Reserve. So these uh, important green arrows uh, actually uh, facilitated through different avenues such as nature ways, uh, park connectors, and even nature corridors. So the blue arrows you see outside here are actually uh, uh, the marine illustrates the marine connectivity in our in our waters. So this much of this connectivity is actually uh, dependent on hydrodynamic currents uh, in the water. So this helps to transport things such as uh, mangrove propagules or even coral larvae between uh, different uh, different islands, so islands in the north here and also our southern islands. And okay, so this is an example of a nature way. So some of you might have uh, visited here and you've seen, oh, there's quite a lot of different types of planting or uh, different types of uh, vegetation that are being planted along these roads. So these are routes which are planted with uh, native plant and tree species. So the aim is to mimic uh, the rain for the structure of a rainforest, so the multi-tiered structure with different vegetation growing at different heights. So uh, this helps to uh, mimic uh, different types of habitats within a forest. So we have the forest floor, maybe the understory layer or the canopy layer. So in the long term, we actually uh, aspire to make every road uh, a nature way. So we hope that everyone can get to experience uh, the feeling of walking in a rainforest, even when walking along the road. We also have the Lawny Nature Corridor. So this is this serves a three-in-one function. So it acts as a nature way, a park connector, and also a buffer to the central catchment nature reserve. So it's really important because it, it protects our nature areas from uh, different age effects, such as wind or drying, so that our core areas are actually much better protected uh, from any disturbances from the outside. So I think this is a great example of how our roads can be transformed into a more natural landscape. So this supports both nature and recreation uh, while all being integrated within an urban landscape. Okay, so this slide's a bit more dense, so just bear with me. So we have different types of uh, methods uh, for forest restoration. So the first one we have here, which I'll go into is the framework species model. So how this works is we will plant a uh, nitrogen fixing species, which helps to uh, enrich the soil. And after that, we'll follow up with different fruit bearing species. And these will help to attract animals and also facilitate seed dispersal and pollination. So over time, uh, with all these uh, different type of plants, the soil condition will improve and will uh, allow us to slowly uh, attract different types of, uh, of our native uh, plants from the nature reserves. So this technique is actually used for, uh, to restore very large areas of scrubland. And as I go into different methods, so all of these have different uh, aims and, and goals. So the second one is assisted natural regeneration. So this actually involves the removal of exotic weeds uh, so that they compete with our native tree species. So this is more sensitively implemented over time so as to not impact uh, some of the habitats provided by some of these species. So this is a method to actually restore smaller areas of scrubland. So not, not uh, on such a large scale as the first method uh, by marking and protecting uh, different seedlings within these uh, areas. And the last one we have is maximal species diversity. So that's actually uh, used in areas where there may be secondary forests uh, already established. So how this works is by introducing dominant uh, primary rainforest species, so which might be limited by dispersal or maybe they are rarer in occurrence. And so we plant this, these seedlings of these species uh, in the forest, and they are more adapted to shade conditions. So they actually need uh, such canopy, the canopy of secondary forest to establish themselves. So yeah, these might, this is probably applied in uh, areas where there are already secondary forest presence, in, such as in our nature parks. So there's an example of forest restoration works done at Rifle Range Nature Park. So I think what, what we are aiming to do is to not just restore and enhance uh, our nature reserves, but we also want to uh, enhance our various parks and gardens so that these areas can provide stepping stones for our native flora and fauna, which is a, uh, really important for connectivity. Yeah. 
in Singapore. Okay, so there's a great example. So there's Rasal Walk at Jurong Lake Gardens. So it's a restored freshwater swamp habitat. Uh, there's over 50 types of species that have been planted. So we have the stealing wax palm, as you can see here in the front, in the foreground. So this one is the one, the red trunk. Uh, so there's a freshwater swamp species. So the wetlands here are actually inundated with water based on uh, the water levels in the lake. So they're actually affected by the rise and fall of the water, maybe due to rain or different other other environmental conditions. So this is actually a great uh, foraging area for water birds such as our herons and egrets. So just in February 2020, uh, we had a, uh, three black wing stilts, which are rare migrants slash residents, uh, visit Drong Lake Gardens, so the wetland area here. So if you would like to pay a visit, I think you can spot uh, quite a lot of rare birds uh, in Drong Lake Gardens uh, nowadays. And <clears throat> next, we also have our species recovery framework. So these are our targeted efforts to uh, conserve some of our more rare or uh, endemic uh, native species that we have in Singapore. So currently we have 80 plant and 40 animal species on this list. Uh, and we hope to increase that to 100 plant and 60 animals by 2030. So here we have two examples, which I'd like to highlight. So first we have the cinnamon bush frog. So it's actually uh, quite uncommon. Uh, to rare uh, species that is confined to our nature reserves, so only seen in Bukit Hima and Central Catchment. But we have successfully introduced a small population into Singapore Botanic Gardens, the rainforest patch. Uh, so this species, uh, what's interesting is that it lays its eggs in uh, really small tree cavities. So this, habit, this microhabitat is actually quite rare in Singapore. Uh, so we've introduced uh, kind of these artificial structures, uh, tree trunks, uh, for these frogs uh, to lay their eggs in so that uh, uh, they can do better in our forest. Next, we also have the Singapore freshwater crab. So actually, how many of you actually have actually seen uh, crabs in Singapore in our forest? So actually, it's quite rare. It's quite a rare sight, right? Uh, so this uh, crab is actually endemic to Singapore and it can be found nowhere else in the world. So we have actually successfully translocated uh, and released some of these crabs uh, to selected streams in Singapore. Uh, to help bolster their populations. So as of 2021, we've released uh, more than 100 individuals into the wild. And I think one interesting fact about uh, these crabs is that uh, females actually carry and brood their eggs uh, from all the way from eggs to tiny crabbers. So they bring them up to full term. So they actually carry all the small crabs uh, in their abdomen and protect them uh, from any predators. Uh, yeah, so I think that really helps uh, improve the survival rate of these of their young, uh, since it prevents them from uh, simply being washed away uh, downstream or to the sea when they hatch. So besides animals, we also uh, focus a lot, a lot on plants. So we conserve uh, the germplasm, which is living tissue uh, of plants uh, through different collections, uh, living collections uh, such as trees in our nurseries and seeds, which is stored in our uh, Singapore Botanic Garden seed bank here. So native germplasm is actually collected from our core biodiversity areas. And we try to propagate them in our parks, uh, nature reserves, so to help reintroduce some of these species that might be very rare uh, back into our parks uh, and nature reserves uh, to help with habitat enhancement efforts. So next time uh, you swing by Botanic Gardens, you can take a look at the seed bank uh, over here. So as part of our research efforts, we also, uh, to aid in conservation planning, we also conduct uh, many different types of surveys. So this includes uh, freshwater surveys. Uh, so these, this is where we do stream mapping, to map out different types of streams in our forests, and also to sample uh, different types of freshwater fauna. So the crabs, which I mentioned earlier, and also different types, different types of shrimp uh, or dragonfly larvae, which might be in the water. So vegetation surveys also help us to get a better idea of the different types of uh, uh, community composition in the forest. So uh, it helps us to map out uh, the types of forests, uh, maybe a secondary forest, there's rubber forest. Uh, so this really helps us in our uh, conservation work. And lastly, we also have fauna surveys. So this helps us to find out more about the ecology and behavior of native animals, such as the slow loris. As you can see here on the bottom right, so these are really rare uh, cryptic animals, which might be hard to spot in our forests. And we conduct surveys uh, 
to better assess how these animals are doing. So some of the different surveys that we do, uh, uh, just a subset, is a comprehensive surveys. So uh, we have done actually done a comprehensive, comprehensive survey of Bukit Timah Nature Reserve uh, back in 2019. So actually found many uh, new species uh, to Singapore and potentially signs. So many of these are actually invertebrates, uh, such as spiders or beetles uh, that are new to science. So one of them here, you can see uh, on the left here is uh, Pecula bukitimaensis. So there's a new species to science. And we also have the Singapore bent-toed gecko, which is a new record for Bukitima nature itself. So as you can see, there's a lot more that's left to be discovered uh, about nature reserves, uh, even though uh, Singapore is such a small island. And next, we also uh, like to focus on uh, outreach programs uh, for, the, for the community. So the public can actually contribute to citizen science through our community uh, in nature biodiversity watch programs. So we have uh, different types of biodiversity watches. So that's, uh, we have heron watch, uh, we have dragonfly watch, we also have garden bird watch. So these are some of the different programs that we carry out uh, that you can be involved in. And these are actually carried out by citizen scientists, so by the public. Uh, so actually, we have actually expanded from just 400 citizen scientists in 2015 to over 9,000 in 2020. So it's really a big jump. And uh, we do uh, warmly invite you to join us for some of these surveys. Uh, so besides uh, the outreach programs, which I mentioned earlier, so we also have different types of activities, so such as invasive species management. So this involves the removal of weeds, as I mentioned, for the forest uh, restoration plants, and also plant propagation and tree planting. So this is under our One Million Trees movement. And now I'll pass the time to my colleague Gervais, who will elaborate more about uh, how digitalization is being harnessed in different fields in, uh, within NPARCs. All right, thanks, thanks Dylan for that. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Gervais uh, from NPAX's um, Center of Urban Greenery and Ecology. Uh, and uh, yeah, really excited to be able to share with you uh, about how uh, NPAX uh, uses digitalization and technology in our efforts to transform Singapore into a city in nature. I'm just waiting for this slide to move on to the next one. So if you just give me a little while. Uh, but a key, uh, okay, great, so here we are. So the idea of um, adopting digital technologies as, uh, and, and taking a data-centric approach to the way we uh, transform Singapore into a city in nature is at the end of the day, we're really trying to adopt right, a science-based approach uh, to do all these things. One that is based on evidence, uh, one that is based, based on data that will enable us to make you know, informed decisions uh, by having an integrated system right, of technologies as well as data and sensors coming in. This also helps us to enable um, greater coordination, synergy, and efficiency in the way that we implement these strategies. And finally, by having you know, technology to enable us to do things uh, by coordinating our information, it also enables us to become more adaptive to rapid changes that occur in our operating landscape, such as those brought about by climate change, as well as COVID-19. Uh, when it comes to adopting science, uh, digitalization and technology in MPAX. MPAX basically has a science and technology master plan to coordinate these efforts. Uh, what this master plan does is that it sets out key areas, key focus areas or key domains uh, that MPAX has identified as important in order to achieve you know, our, our, our mission uh, and our city and nature vision. Uh, so these include key areas like arboriculture and horticulture, include things like botany, such as the work that is being done at the Singapore Botanic Gardens, things like conservation biology and plant Planning, which enable us to make you know, decisions to uh, conserve our biodiversity in Singapore and understanding how humans and nature interact as well. So that's where biofilter comes in. Uh, that's where animal health and management comes in as well. And undergirding all these you know, different uh, key focus areas where we bucket you know, our technologies and our, our research efforts is the use of uh, digitalization and operational technologies in order to enable all these things to happen. Uh, moving on to the next slide here. Sorry, you just give me a bit. Uh, 
There we go. Um, so when it comes to using digital technology specifically, MPARCS also has a digitalization master plan to coordinate these efforts. Um, we basically focus our technologies and digitalization uh, efforts into key focus areas as well. So for example, regarding tree management or animal management, biosecurity, and all these different uh, buckets basically uh, feed into a centralized um, platform uh, that is a map based called uh, Maven 2. Uh, and that enables us to basically uh, feed in all this information uh, and uh, process it and analyze it in a way that can then enable our site officers to make timely informed decisions. Uh, more on these buckets. So when, when I talk about these buckets, these buckets uh, are really what we call ecosystems. So we have a tree management ecosystem for our technologies, for example. We have an ecosystem for our park management technologies and digital tools. Uh, we have another ecosystem for biodiversity management. And what this enables us to do is to you know, um, implement you know, and push out the application of our technology and digitalization in a, a systematic and integrated way. Uh, it also enables us to you know, pilot these things in buckets. So for example, you know, through our digitalization trial that's taking place at Bishan Ang Mokyo. So this uh, was launched uh, at the start of last year. And once uh, this trial is successfully completed, we also hope to be able to roll out some of our newer technologies uh, into uh, our parks across the island. And so I've spoken a bit about buckets, right? Uh, the different uh, core areas where we focus our technologies and digital efforts in. Uh, We're going to share more about some of these specific tools that we use uh, in three different areas, specifically regarding tree management. And then we we'll go on to share about park management and biodiversity management uh, later. Uh, before I go into the details, just a quick uh, heads up to everyone that we're actually going to run a short quiz uh, right after each of these sections. Um, and we're actually going to uh, award prizes uh, for the fastest uh, answers that come in for each of these sections. So if you are interested in getting some uh, edible seeds, uh, sorry, seeds for edible plants that you can grow at home, uh, pay some attention. Uh, and who knows, you might be one of our lucky winners for uh, the prizes today from our quizzes. So yeah, on the tree management. Um, trees clearly are an important part of our city in nature. Uh, trees uh, provide lots of benefits uh, for, for, for us as human beings to begin with. Um, they help to cool down our environment. Um, they help to uh, um, provide an aesthetic quality to the places that we live, you know, work and play. They bring the therapeutic effects of nature closer to us. Uh, they uh, form an important part of uh, our uh, strategy against fighting uh, to, to fight climate change because trees sequester carbon uh, and um, yeah and, and therefore remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere uh, and you know help to mitigate the effects of climate change and trees of course provide habitat for biodiversity uh, as well uh, even in our urban landscapes um, and parks you know manages something to the odd uh, of uh, six million trees, uh, two, two million of which happen in highly urbanized areas. And so it then becomes, you know, uh, important for us, you know, to harness digitalization and technology uh, to uh, continually improve the way that we manage these trees, especially in light of the fact that our tree population will continue to expand uh, with all our city and nature strategies, such as the one million trees movement. Uh, before I go into some of the details regarding some of the technologies and digital tools that we use for tree management, uh, it's, I, I find it quite helpful for us to, you know, to be able to get a grasp, a basic grasp of what a tree is. Uh, I'm, 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 a, I'm, a, I'm a forest ecologist by academic training, uh, and I'm also a certified harborist, so I can get a bit technical uh, with these things. Uh, but a tree essentially uh, is defined as uh, a woody a uh, perennial plant, so a plant that you know, can last, that, that, that lasts for um, you know, many years uh, and usually has you know, a single dominant trunk for most species and also a mature height that is defined at a particular height. Um, typically, this is defined at five meters tall, though for some of our native uh, species, especially those that grow in the understory, a uh, tree can be as short uh, as two meters uh, in height. Uh, trees also, you know, comprise of various different uh, components, right? So you've got the canopy of the trees, which comprises of leaves, which are the, you know, key uh, food producing organs of our trees. And then they are held up, right, by branches. Uh, the trees, uh, trees are also comprised, no, trees also comprise of, you know, a trunk uh, that, uh, you know, might, you know, then diverge into a few secondary, uh, uh, secondary uh, structural branches, such as the rain tree that you see in this picture here. And what the trunk and the secondary branches do uh, is essentially provide 
provide firstly a, a, a structural function uh, to, to the tree. It helps to hold up the entire tree structure. So really quite important. And of course, they provide a physio physiological function as well for the tree uh, to transport nutrients, uh, transport water from the ground uh, up into the rest of the tree canopy. And then we've got the roots uh, of the tree as well, which uh, likewise play uh, you know, a couple of very important functions. Firstly, a physiological one by you know, absorbing water and nutrients, you know, taking them up from the soil and transporting them to the rest of the tree. And also a very important structural function because they provide the tree with an anchorage right, that it needs to be able to remain in the landscape over a prolonged period of time. Um, I bring you through these different sections, these different um, parts and components of a tree because this is typically the lens in which tree care experts uh, look at trees. Uh, tree care experts are technically known as arborists. You might have heard of that term before. Uh, more informally, you might have heard the term, you know, um, tree doctor uh, or tree surgeon or even a public gardener uh, being used to describe uh, arborists. So, in you know, um, uh, um, to, to manage uh, the trees, the many, many trees that we have across Singapore, uh, arborists, you know, are really the heroes in the background that help us uh, to, to, to ensure that our trees remain healthy and stable in our landscape. So we've prepared a short video for you just to uh, give you some more context about what these folks do. So sit back and enjoy. There are more trees than people in Singapore. 7 million trees of many species, shapes and sizes. We have tall trees, iconic trees, colourful trees, and pretty trees. For me, uh, prettiest trees is the Bibora Rosia, the Singapore Sakura Trumpet. For me, uh, I prefer the yellow rain tree. If you grow from seeds, maybe one out of a hundred, you get one. It has an expensive taste. And you know, maybe as I aspire to plant the entire road with all the yellow rain trees to leave a legacy behind. Meet the guys who work with trees, specifically the ones you see along the roads. Hi, I'm Brian. Hi, I'm Eric. We are from Swisscape and we are the Public Gardeners of Singapore. We are commonly called the tree doctors because we take care of the trees. Ah. We will use diagnostic tools. So if there are defects, we need to check further. Especially for those big trees, we take the health very seriously. We wouldn't want the tree to fail and then cause any harm to the public. Okay, so we've heard about the trees. But what about the flowers? Brian is a flower boy. Even tree he likes flowering trees. Though I'm, I don't look really that flowery. <laughs> My colleagues, we form this flowering WhatsApp group. And whenever they spot trees that are flowering, they can deposit these images into this WhatsApp group. And that's where I consolidate all this, especially which period in the year that it starts to flower. Whoa, the photos are nice. And there are more images of flowering trees on trees.sg. So these are the smaller operations. What about the bigger operations? The big scale one will be transplanting the trees. We must be very mindful not to damage the roots. Ideally, we want to move them to another permanent place. But in the event that we can't find, we will house these trees in what we call tree banks. Wait, a tree what? So here we are. We are at one of the biggest tree banks in Singapore. It's about 9.5 hectares. And we have more than 5,000 trees here. The trees here are sitting well, enjoying the sea breeze. I find trees fascinating. The way they grow, the self-optimizing structures. The massive tree trunk absorbs the atmospheric carbon. So this is one of the main functions that will help to alleviate climate change. Speaking of climate change, there's one reason why you see more of us green folks in places like MRT columns, overhead bridges and high-rise buildings. We cool your surroundings, and that helps to control the increasing temperatures caused by the urban heat island effect, which is basically the heat trapped by urban surfaces like buildings and roads due to solar radiation and human activity. You're welcome! We also help to provide homes for various animals. I'm what you'd call the canopy. My friends here attract various animals. The tall one beside me is popular with the birds because of the insect prey out there. <laughs> The fruits and flowers in the shops below attract butterflies and bees too. So when our animal friends move between other trees and plants, they enrich the flora and fauna around the island. We aspire to make every road a nature way. So multi-tier planting, we have different heights to mimic what a tropical rainforest is like. We also want to bring nature very close to the public. 
We have evolved throughout the years. Now we are moving towards a city nature. Human beings are innately attracted to nature. And that is the reason why people have been going outdoors to take photo shoots to create memories in their whole entire lifetime. When you come back from other countries and you take a taxi, what greets you when you go home is a rows of majestic trees like the rain trees. And it actually bring you back to the nature. And you sense a sense of belonging, a sense of hope. Right, hope you enjoyed that video courtesy of uh, our grandfather's story. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that really provides a wonderful overview, right, of what our arborists uh, in Singapore do and how the work also, right, has evolved over the years, uh, especially as Singapore becomes, you know, more uh, green, especially when our uh, tree population has started to increase and we start to plant trees in different methods as well, right, such as our multi-tiered uh, structure that, we mentioned, uh, that, that was mentioned in the video earlier. Uh, regarding the use of technology and digital tools to manage trees, uh, in uh, across Singapore, uh, MPARCS has been doing this right uh, already for, uh, for 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 many years. So we are not really setting our efforts from scratch, really. Uh, but over the years, what we have done is that we have sought to improve right the tools, uh, use newer technologies in order to uh, inspect and manage our trees in a better way. So for example, we've you know, progressed to using lighter tools over the years, tools that are more easily brought by our park uh, and, uh, and our streetscape managers uh, to the sites right, where they need to inspect the trees and manage the trees. Uh, we've started to use tools that enable us to inspect and assess our trees more rapidly. And we've also used, um, started to use tools that enable us to uh, more easily access portions of trees you know, that are typically hard to reach, especially the canopy. Um, in terms of inventorizing our trees or keeping a catalog of the trees that we manage as well. Uh, again, we've not, you know, we've been doing this for many years already, but we've, you know, also progressed in the way we've done it. So in the past, this used to be done really, you know, through paper and file method. That was really how it started out. We then progressed to using it on a digital system uh, and then on a map-based system, which then enables you to pinpoint where those trees are in a spatial format. And finally, moving forward, we started to use, you know, tree modeling, um, LiDAR, remote sensing technologies to enable us to catalog of trees. Um, these are the different, uh, so this is, this, is, this is a snapshot, right, of the tree management ecosystem that we that we have. So different buckets of technology, you know, using technologies that we use for tree, man uh, tree inventory, uh, technologies that we use for tree inspection, diagnostics, technologies that we use for tree modeling. Um, and basically what this diagram then shows too is that all the information that we obtain from these different tools and sensors actually then feeds into a centralized uh, system called Maven 2. So this is a, a GIS spatial platform. So one that is map based and uh, enables uh, us to be able to consolidate this information and to uh, then make decisions right on the go uh, regarding our tree management. Uh, more about tree inventory. So currently, how MPAX inventorizes our tree uh, is, is essentially using Maven, uh, the Maven system, right? So this is a map-based system that I mentioned earlier. It looks something like the one that you see uh, on the bottom left uh, of this uh, of this slide. So one that is map-based. Uh, in this system, each tree is given a unique uh, ID. Uh, it's also geotagged, so it's on, on a particular location on a map. Uh, it basically serves right uh, like a record. Uh, so it, it, so for 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 park officers or streetscape managers, it serves like a record of all the trees right they fall under their management very much like how you know as a uh, doctor for example you might have a record of all the patients under your care um, so the, the the database that we have is continually enhanced with our tree uh, registry information and it, you know we are also expanding this out to other trees that are managed across uh, Singapore like that um, uh, in, a, in, in, the, in the town councils uh, the tree registry uh, is also uh, uh, available for use by our site officers on an iPad. Um, so they bring out the iPad when they go out to inspect and manage their trees and it enables them to assess uh, the tree information and records on the fly as they make uh, their site arounds around their parks or their streetscapes or the nature reserves. Um, when you have all this information, right, uh, on trees in a tree registry format, uh, this enables you to actually do quite a few powerful things. Firstly, it enables you to have an overview, right, of the tree population that you are managing across Singapore. Uh, secondly, it allows you to conduct uh, certain forms of data analytics uh, for trees 
populations in certain areas of Singapore. So for example, if you are managing a certain area of Singapore, um, you could un then understand the age profile of the trees that are, um, that, 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 that are in that area, or you can understand the species uh, distribution of the trees that are in the area. What that enables the site manager to do then is to really make some informed decisions, right? Regarding how often they should maintain prune their trees, for example, how often they should fertilize their trees. Uh, also enables decision making regarding um, what trees you should plant in that particular area. So you might choose to plant certain types of trees in certain areas so as to improve the species diversity yeah, of the urban tree population in that area. The current database includes about 90% of the tree population in our public spaces and we hope to expand this in the years to come. Uh, in terms of tree inspection, we do leverage lots of tools as well. We use resistance drilling um, through a, a tool that is called the resistograph. Uh, basically, what this does is that it inserts a very small drill. It doesn't hurt the tree very much. But when you insert this drill at a constant uh, speed, uh, at a constant rate into the tree and detect the resistance that the drill faces, it very quickly allows you to build up a profile of what's going on in the tree, right? So if a very high amount of resistance is encountered by the drill, then you get sense um, that the tree uh, is uh, sound and healthy, right? The wood is intact. But when the resistance drops, that then may, may then signal that there is a cavity or some decay that's going on in the tree. So the resistor graph produces a graph, like the one that you see on the slide. Um, it then enables the sub officers to know whether or not there is some level of decay or, uh, or cavity that occurs in the tree. It also enables the site officer to know how much decay, uh, how much of a cavity there is in the tree, and then it enables the site officer to make a decision regarding whether or not they should remove the tree, whether or not they should prune the tree down to keep the load light, or whether the tree might be perfectly healthy, right? And then it enables the site officer to know that the tree is actually fine. Another tool that we use is called the sonic tomograph. Uh, sonic tomograph basically works on the simple principle that sound travels through uh, solid wood at a faster rate than across a hollow space or through decayed wood. So when you've got these multiple sensors, you know, around a tree, and then you start tapping on each of these sensors and the other sensors, you know, serve as ears to detect sound that is being, you know, tapped on, uh, that is being produced when you tap on one of those sensors. Uh, repeat that across many sensors and all the sensors, you know, hearing and listening to all these sound waves uh, very quickly allows you to build a profile of what a tree looks, uh, the, the, of the internal condition of a tree at that particular Plane. So it produces an image that the one that you see on the bottom right of this uh, slide uh, enables you to get uh, to quantify the amount of decay or even cavity that is present right in the tree. And then you can make uh, tree management decisions based on that. Uh, when it comes to uh, inspecting trees, especially in the aerial parts of trees, uh, M Parks has also started to use drones to enable us to conduct aerial inspections. Typically, aerial inspections are fairly, uh, you know, manual or uh, resource-intensive process, right? You are um, traditionally our operators will actually climb a tree uh, to be able to inspect what's going on at the top of the tree, uh, or you would maybe arrange for a lorry crane or a bucket lift or a cherry picker to bring you to the top of the tree, right? So that you could do branch inspections or cavity inspections like the ones that you see on this on, 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 in the video in front of you. Now, a drone enables you to see all these things, but not actually have to deploy all these resources. So that's really helpful. And then the added benefit too is that a drone enables you to quickly, you know, uh, identify some of the biodiversity that lives in our tree canopies as well, including our urban trees, such as, you know, you know, climbers and orchids. And that helps to feed in more information regarding, you know, our urban tree population too. Uh, moving forward, MPARS is developing what we call a digital twin of our urban tree. So um, we have uh, we are in the process of developing something called a remote tree measurement system, also known as RTMS. It looks like something like the one that you see on the top right uh, of this screen. Uh, basically, what this digital twin is is uh, you know uh, a uh, is basically a digital version right of the, of, of the tree that is actually physically present on site. And we give and, and we have this you know digital twin because we can deploy lidar technology as well as machine learning to be able to model and develop such, um, yeah, uh, uh, such visualizations of the trees. Uh, by having a digital twin of our urban trees, that enables us to do a few things. It enables us to firstly conduct measurements of our trees remotely and to also conduct some form of basic inspection of our trees because you know the digital twin gives you a sense of what the overall tree structure is like. It also enables us to do things like tree growth modeling as well as you know monitor the amount of carbon sequestration that is over time accumulated in our urban tree population and it also enables us to automatically update our tree inventory. 
Uh, we are also in a process you know, uh, of developing three models. We have developed three models and are continuing to refine them over the years. Uh, three models basically enable us to predict how trees will behave you know, under a certain set of conditions. So for example, under a certain set of wind conditions. We build these models through a variety of methods. We consider the tree architecture, you know, how wide the canopy is, how tall the canopy is, uh, what the overall height of the tree is, where that first bifurcation or first branching point of the tree is. We also take into account the wood strength of the tree uh, and the rooting space that is present for that particular tree. And what it enables us to do is then understand uh, how likely a tree might fail, say, uproot uh, under a certain set of wind conditions. When we understand that, then that enables us to make a decision on, say, how much we need to prune the tree by. You know, you change you know, tree structure, you alter the tree structure such that you improve the safety of that tree under the same set of wind conditions. Uh, so really quite interesting stuff that we're doing on this front. Uh, some other tools that we are using uh, in terms of, uh, you know, assessing the health of our trees uh, include using multi-spectral analysis, which very quickly, you know, enable us to pick up trees across a landscape that have less chlorophyll than others. Uh, and that typically might indicate that a tree require, uh, might, a tree might have, you know, might, might be facing certain physiological issues and that, that enables you to, you know, uh, focus your inspection efforts on those particular trees on uh, in, in, in the landscape. We also use panoramic imagery, very much like how you know you would have a Google Street View image, right? Uh, so you mount a camera on top of a car, you drive the car down the road, capture all these images, layer you know layer on top of it, you know a um a digital twin of these trees, and then you know you get the visual of the tree, um and as well as a digital twin of the tree while sitting in front of your desk. So that very quickly enables you to point out which of the trees might be you know, uh, facing uh, significant and obvious uh, defects uh, of physio physiological issues. And then site officers can pay more attention to these trees when they actually inspect them on site. Finally, we also install wireless tilt sensors uh, on some of our more mature trees in the landscape. The tilt sensors basically detect sudden tree movement that may take place, for example, during a storm event, the tree partially uproots. Uh, when that happens, an alert is sent to the uh, site officer um, and the site officer can then quickly go down to site or deploy a contractor down to site to quickly mitigate the issue. So for example, by removing uh, that partially uprooted tree. Uh, finally, uh, technologies like this don't just enable us to manage our trees well, but actually enable us to, you know, uh, conduct effective uh, outreach uh, and engagement to the wider community. So a very good example of this is our Trees SG website. If you have not visited that before, I strongly encourage you to do so. Um, you can just type in Trees SG literally on Google. Uh, it will bring you to this website. And it's a really, really quite an interesting map uh, to be able to kind of play with. Um, what it enables you to do, uh, so, so firstly, this map is built on our existing tree registry system, right? So it's the same trees that are catalogued in Mpux's internal system. What the map enables you to do is a few things. Firstly, you can search for the trees in your own neighborhood. So you can go out, take a walk, look at the map, and you can actually understand, you know, uh, you can uh, find out what the trees uh, surrounding your HDD block, for example, are. Uh, it then also enables you uh, to plot in trees that you have that you have planted, for example, under the 1 million trees movement. So it serves as a visual indicator of a tree uh, that you've planted in the landscape, something that you've contributed to a city in nature. And then over time, you know, over the years, you can then go back to the map, search for the tree again, find out where it is, go back, you know, and it helps you to locate the tree on site. And then you can visit and see how that tree is doing over a period of time. Right, enough of me talking, um, we're on to our first question for the quiz. Uh, and you know, again, rules of the quiz are simple. You can just simply type in your answer in the Zoom chat. And if your answer is correct and you are the fastest person to uh, answer the question, you basically win a prize from us. So here's the first question for, our, uh, for, for, for this segment uh, of, the, of, of, of the webinar. Uh, yeah, I'll name two technologies that MPUX uses for tree inspection. So again, the question is name two technologies that MPUX uses for tree inspection. And if you know the answer, type it in the Zoom chat. Um, we will quickly see that and we can quickly identify uh, the answer, uh, the, the fastest and correct answers. All right, I see uh, an answer from Eric who uh, basically says uh, uh, drilling and tomography. Uh, that's correct. So congratulations, Eric, you've won a set of seats. Uh, and I see another set of answers from... Uh, uh, from, from Fazula Rahman, uh, who has basically uh, listed the drone as well as the resistor graph. So congratulations, Fazula, you've gotten those two technologies correct as well. Uh, and yeah, so really a whole suite of technologies that we use, uh, really much more than two. Um, but this is just to 
um, go to show um, the, 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 the extent to which uh, we think technology is really important in the way that we inspect and manage our, our, our trees. Right, on to the next segment uh, of uh, technologies that we use. Uh, we um, So on to the park management ecosystem. Uh, parks are well loved by Singaporeans. Uh, we've always known that uh, over the years, we discovered that even more during the COVID-19 period, right, when parks became a very well loved space uh, for Singaporeans to, you know, get a bit of a retreat away from working from home and things like that, find somewhere to exercise. Yeah, and so to continue to manage our parks well and effectively, uh, and parks uh, likewise uses digital technologies uh, and, 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 yeah, and, and data as well in the way that we manage our parks. So we do this in the area of horticulture, we do this in the areas of facilities, we do this in the area of visitor management, and again, all these uh, tools uh, in combination, uh, the, the information, the data that we get from these tools are combined into our centralized Maven 2 platform. What this enables us to do when you've got all these inputs that are integrated into one single place is uh, it allows officers to firstly monitor right, the park condition, you know, situation you know, in the park uh, on the go from their own mobile devices so they don't necessarily have to be physically on site all the time. This enables site officers to know things in a timely manner and also, you know, in a holistic manner as well. So by enhancing the situational awareness you know, of the park, the park officer can then make timely and informed decisions uh, on the fly. In the area of horticulture management, just to point out that there are two, you know, uh, significant technologies uh, that we use uh, specifically with respect to lawn management. So, for example, and parks uses uh, grass height sensors. Uh, these sensors might be attached to lawn mowers, like the one that you see in that animation. There, they may be attached to uh, the net set cutters as well that uh, the individual workers carry as they do the grass cutting activities. Uh, what the sensors enable us to do is to remotely monitor the quality of grass cutting, right, the height to which the grass is being cut as well as the overall area of coverage. And this enables us you know, to perform quality scoring and assessment of the work done uh, based on the evidence that's generated from these sensors. So this then help to, helps to complement site inspections that we do after the works are completed. Another piece of technology that we use for lawn management are automated lawn mowers. Uh, for those of us who have visited you know, our, uh, some of our parks, our larger parks around Singapore, you have already seen these very much in action. So it's quite cute, actually. You've got this lawn mower that you know, goes over an activity lawn, you know, chucks its way, uh, looks like a, <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, yeah, a little animal, a little device right, that goes over our lawns and keeps them uh, consistently mowed. Uh, to a consistent height and that becomes very important especially for lawns that are used for activities like events or sports so the lawn mowers uh, you know um, uh, cut the grass on a scheduled basis uh, and uh, and they are really a way of you know helping us to perform lawn mowing on a timely and effective basis without actually having to do it manually when it comes to facilities, MPARCS deploys a whole bunch of different sensors in different areas. So we use that for light fault detecting. Um, the sensors enable us to pinpoint where the light faults are. Typically, the only way you would do that would be to perform regular night checks uh, with you know, site officers, with your contractors, and then try to physically spot where the uh, spot lights are. Uh, with light fault reporting system, very quickly, you can pinpoint which light exactly uh, is down at you know, any given point in time. It then enables you to deploy your contractor to that specific light. Um, uh, very quickly, you, know, you can use system two to monitor the response time of the contractors. And very importantly, the system then gathers information about light faults over a period, you know, extended period of time. That then enables us to do what we call preventive maintenance, right? When you know um, at which stage your lights start to go, you then can deploy your resources to maintain these lights before these incidents actually happen. So that's really quite a powerful tool that we are starting to use and deploy over our parks. We use sensors in our washrooms as well as our bins, these really are for the purposes of cleanliness. Um, they trigger alerts, for example, whether ammonia levels or whether the bin fullness levels have reached a certain threshold, uh, and that our contractors can go down on a timely basis to clean out these things um, without actually having to you know, regularly inspect these things over and over again. Uh, we also use weather sensors in our parks. These enable us to conduct on-site monitoring of weather conditions, such as whether it's sunny or whether it's dry, you know, if it's like in the period of drought, um, that then interacts, right? This system of sensors then interacts with other systems that we have in the park. For example, a smart irrigation system or a visitor information system. So for example, you can then trigger the irrigation system to water your plants when you know, there's a prolonged period of drought. So all in all, these sensors enable us to do a few things. They reduce the need for 
constant inspection, right, of all our different facilities, help us to detect problems uh, when they happen or even preemptively. Um, they allow us to also deploy uh, our resources in a more targeted manner. Uh, technology has also become very important for us in terms of park visitor management, especially in the situation of COVID-19. So it's great, right, that Singaporeans love our parks, want to come down to our parks, but we also want to make sure that Singaporeans can continue to enjoy our parks in a safe manner, right? So we developed this safe distance at parks portal um, last year. It was, sorry, two years ago. So that was launched on 4th April in 2020. It was rolled out really quickly because we had built it on our, on our existing tree registry system. And what this system does is that it integrates information, park visitor information from a variety of sources, our CCTVs, you know, also drones that we fly, as well as surveillance robots. We also integrate information that comes in from our parking lots as well. So enabling us to you know, understand how full our car parks are. Uh, what this very quickly enables us to do is to build a picture of how crowded our parks are uh, as a whole, uh, which parks are crowded, and in fact, which parts of our parks are crowded. This uh, is reflected you know, in the system as such, um, and, and it's helpful from, from, from two points of view. Uh, as a park goer, you then understand which parts of a park are too crowded, and then you can then avoid those parts of the park uh, um, when, when they are crowded. Uh, as a site officer or park manager, is then very helpful too because then it enables you to deploy um, safe distancing officers specifically to, the, to those areas to make sure that safe distancing measures are still abided by by our park users. Uh, so it all in all really allows for a more sustainable approach in managing our safe, safe distance operations. Again, enough of me uh, talking about technology. So again, second quiz uh, for today regarding park management technologies. Again, uh, fastest, fingers, fastest fingers first. And uh, as long as you've got the right question, you get first time in your answer into, into the chat, you will send a chance to win a seat packet from us. So question two is as such, uh, grass cutting is typically a labor-intensive procedure. Name one way the M parks is improving its efficiency and effectiveness in grass cutting. So again, the question is, name one way the M parks is improving its efficiency and effectiveness in grass cutting. Just wait for the answers to come in. Yep, there's one on uh, one on uh, automated mower. That's from uh, James Young. So congratulations, James. James, uh, you've won yourself a seat packet. Uh, and let's see if we've got another one. Yes, we've got one again from Fazula Rahman on remote monitoring. So yes, we also use grass height sensors that enable us to remotely track where our grass is being cut and the height to which it's being cut uh, without uh, having to always necessarily be present on site. So congratulations to the two of you uh, on winning your prize. Um, and now I will pass the time back to Dylan to wrap up today's session with, by sharing with us some of the uh, very interesting technologies uh, that we use for biodiversity management. So lots of uh, nice uh, animations and clips uh, coming up. So um, stay with us as we finish up this last segment of the webinar. On to you, Dylan. All right, thanks a lot, Javis, uh, for sharing so much about our tree and park management. I think it's really interesting. So I think the last uh, area that we are focusing on is biodiversity management. So we also leverage uh, technology to carry out conservation efforts under this, uh, under this arm. So uh, just for interest, this picture is actually taken in Pulau Tekuko. So it's one of our southern islands. So we're actually deploying uh, camera traps for the southern islands biodiversity survey. Uh, to kind of find out what uh, animals are on the island. So there's <laughs> some of the surveys that we carry out. Okay, so a quick uh, look at Singapore's biodiversity in numbers. So uh, we actually have a lot of uh, different types of biodiversity in Singapore. So for even for uh, uh, and a small island like us, so we have over 2,000 species of vascular plants, we have over 400 species of birds, so Singapore is actually awarded a uh, UNESCO Southern Caboose Prize for Environmental Preservation in 2017. So there's a testament to uh, our biodiversity conservation efforts uh, uh, in Singapore. So we actually have a really wide variety of different types of ecosystems uh, in Singapore. So we have marshlands, like freshwater inland bodies. We have our primary and secondary rainforests. We have mangroves, we have mudflats, and even coral reefs. Uh, in Singapore. So we have all these types of different habitats and they all contain uh, different types of uh, plants and animals. 
uh, they have uh, evolved to uh, adapt, they have uh, adapted to all these different types of habitats uh, as their niche. So this slide gives us a broad overview of the different uh, uh, parts of our biodiversity management ecosystem. So we have diagnostic analytics. So we run uh, analytics uh, such as environmental DNA to find out more about uh, the type of fauna that's in our waters. So using these DNA samples from the environment, we can actually detect uh, what types of animals uh, or plants are actually in the water. So this helps us get a better overview uh, of our environment without actually needing to see uh, these species uh, directly. So we also have modeling. So these different types of modeling uh, actually uh, help us to run simulations uh, uh, so that we can predict, uh, better predict what's happening. So for example, we have the oil spill modeling. So this lets us uh, predict uh, how oil spill uh, will flow uh, uh, with accordance to the currents in our water. So this allows us to uh, prepare and uh, put up uh, sufficient mitigation measures uh, to prevent uh, further damage to our marine ecosystems. So for sensors, we actually have a wide variety of sensors that we can deploy out in the field, uh, such as uh, satellite and GPS transmitters, we have underwater drones, we even have uh, sensors for turtle hatchery. So this allows us to conduct uh, remote monitoring uh, and allows us to carry out more passive uh, types of monitoring for different types of animals uh, without uh, seeing them uh, in person. So lastly, we also have monitoring systems. So example of this is the forest fire monitoring system. So this is really important for us to detect, uh, as you may have guessed, forest fires uh, in our nature reserves and parks so that we can take preemptive measures uh, in case of any uh, situations. So all these things are actually integrated uh, in our Maven 2 system, which is the GIS platform uh, as mentioned by Gervais earlier. Uh, and these are just some uh, different types of footages uh, they've taken on parks. So there's the Raffles Banded Langer. So there's actually a uh, really rare uh, 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 primate in Singapore. So the, I think the estimated population is uh, less than 100 individuals. So actually this, we can actually manage to capture one uh, uh, just crossing the rope bridge that we have at Thompson Nature Park and actually really curious and playing with the camera trap, which is really cute. So these uh, langers are really rare. Uh, it's really hard to spot them and they're confined within our nature reserves. So maybe some better areas where you can spot them are like uh, Upper Slita Reservoir Park uh, and also Thompson Nature Park. So maybe next time uh, you're out in these areas, you can keep a lookout for these uh, rare and elusive uh, mammals. So other things that we've also captured in our camera traps include uh, Malayan porcupines. So there's a family of them uh, just crossing a culvert. Uh, we have the Sunda pangolin. Uh, so this is one of the really rare mammals uh, that's being trafficked heavily. We also have the lesser mouse deer. Oops, let me go back. We also have the lesser mouse deer right at the bottom of the screen here. So uh, this can actually be seen. Uh, they're actually more active at night, but you can also see them in the day uh, if you're lucky sometimes uh, in our nature reserves. And lastly, ah, let me just go back to the last video so I can show you. Hmm. I think I can't play. Uh, it's all right. Uh, so the last video is of a leopard cat. So there's a really rare uh, species on mainland. So these camera traps actually help us to detect uh, some of these more uh, elusive uh, nocturnal species. Uh. And here we have our samba deer. So there's a family of them. Uh, so these night vision cameras help us detect uh, some of these nocturnal species, uh, which may otherwise be really hard to detect. So you might need to use torch, torch torches otherwise, but these night vision equipment actually uh, help us see in the dark uh, much more efficiently. So we have the Sunda Kologo on the top right here, just clinging onto a tree. And also we have a Sunda Slow Loris uh, clambering on some branches. Uh. So contrary to their name, they actually uh, move quite quickly. <laughs> As you can see in the video, they are not that slow. So yeah, that's pretty interesting of them. So uh, the deployment of camera traps also allows us to uh, map out the population distributions uh, of different types of animals in Singapore. So this allows us to undertake proper wildlife management measures uh, and also aid us in conservation planning. So you can see like wild boars, maybe they're concentrated around the edges of the nature reserves or if somebody else on the uh, uh, top left, 
and mouse deaths are distributed along these areas. So this actually helps us to uh, uh, prioritize uh, the areas that we want to conserve, uh, these biodiversity hotspots uh, uh, in Singapore. So with a better understanding of all life distributions, uh, we can do better conservation planning uh, for these animals. So let's take a look at one of our uh, projects uh, that we've done in MPARCS, which is the satellite tracking of migratory shorebirds. So I think you guys will find this interesting. So let me just give you a brief uh, run through of the history of uh, uh, tracking uh, shorebirds in Singapore. So in, all the way back in 1990, we, we have actually started using metal rings uh, to tag uh, these shorebirds. So when we bring shorebirds, we actually tag them with these metal rings that are labeled uh, uh, with a special unique ID number uh, that identifies these birds and also it states that Singapore is so, so right below nature, uh, nature reserve. So uh, by ringing these birds, we actually get to uh, learn more about their behavior. So I mean, the types of plumage uh, that they have, uh, the different types of modes. So this forms the baseline of our identification knowledge for these kind of birds. And when we recapture these ring birds, we can actually get a lot of information uh, about their movements uh, and their behavior. So this depends on where they were caught or where they were, when they were initially caught. So if they were caught uh, nine years ago, they recapture it. So we know that uh, maybe a SG Taylor bird uh, can live up to nine years. So this is the type of information that we can get uh, just from uh, ringing and recapture studies. So in 2003, we actually started using flags of uh, green and white color. So it's green over white flags, as we call it. Uh, so this uh, international uh, symbol uh, in the East Asian Australasian flyway uh, for birds that are banded in Singapore. So this actually uh, helps us to track uh, all these birds. So if these birds are actually photographed overseas, uh, let's say in China or Russia, we can actually, having these flags uh, allows uh, other bird watchers or collaborators to tell us uh, that these birds have actually reached these areas and we can actually record this down in our database uh, to find out where these birds are going. So in 2012, we actually, we actually went a step up. We actually went for engraved uh, green over white flags. So these flags uh, are seen in, uh, in this picture here with the wind bro. So these are actually flags which are engraved with a, a letter and number combination. So for example, A5 or B13 or C12. So these flags actually allow us to identify birds in the field without actually having to recapture them. So you can use binoculars or even cameras to take a picture of them. And you can uh, just look at the flags on the lake. Sometimes the, the flags are a bit dirty, but uh, I think with a, bit, a little bit of squinting, you can, you can tell uh, the, the engraving on the flag. So this helps us to uh, better track these birds that return back on our shores. So from 2014 onwards, 2014 to 2017, uh, we actually employ different types of tracking technology. So we have uh, geolocator trackers. So these are really small trackers that we point to birds, uh, but these uh, do not transmit signals and require recapture. And we also have radio trackers, uh, which requires us to be near the animal to receive the signal and also satellite trackers, uh, which can allow us to track remotely using satellite technology and GPS technology. So each of these different trackers actually have uh, various pros and cons. So we will use, uh, we will choose a different type of tracker based on the type of project we're trying to do or the type of bird that we're trying to tag. So it really depends uh, on a case by case scenario. And okay, so these are just some of the examples of migratory shorebirds that we have in Singapore. So the, the more common ones are on top. So common red shang, uh, Pacific golden plover, or lesser sand plover. And we also have some of the rarer ones uh, that you can see in Singapore, or maybe Chick Jawa specifically, such as the Godwit, uh, Terex Sandpiper, and Red Nexton. So interesting story for Terex Sandpiper, we actually have uh, one that is tagged uh, B5. So the flags on the lake actually say B5. And this Terex Sandpiper is actually ringed in November 2013. And uh, it's actually returned to Singapore, somewhere below uh, back every year. So I think people have been seeing it year after year. So I think uh, next time you visit Sonai Bolo, maybe you can take a look and try to find uh, this uh, returning OD to our shores. And so these are the nine major flyways, uh, migratory fly flyways for uh, water birds all across the world. So Singapore is uh, right smack in the middle of the East Asian Australasian flyway. So there's the big red uh, uh, section that's highlighted here. 
in the middle. So actually, uh, these birds actually use these migratory flyways to, to travel between their wintering and breeding grounds uh, every year. So they undertake distances of hundreds and thousands of kilometers uh, flying all the way from the north. So actually, we had a study conducted by NPARPS uh, just in 2020. So it's published in Nature, one of the top uh, scientific journals. Uh, so it actually demonstrated through our tracking studies that uh, some of these birds uh, actually uh, utilize. So we actually demonstrated for the first time that some of these shorebirds actually utilize the Central Asian flyway. So there's the green one. Maybe it's a little hard to see, but it's the green one uh, left of the East Asian Australasian flyway. So these uh, findings ex actually showcase that these shorebirds uh, use the Central Asian flyways uh, and they fly over the Himalayas uh, to reach Singapore. So these findings actually highlight the importance uh, of conserving uh, important uh, wetland habitats in Singapore. So these are uh, points where these shorebirds actually stop over uh, and uh, rest and refuel or they might winter here uh, for the rest of the season. So these are really important sites and using technology we've managed to uh, find out more about the behavior of these birds. So there's a short clip uh, showing the movements of some of the tracked birds from Singapore. So I actually tracked uh, some of these birds from 2017 to 2018. So you can see uh, some of these birds uh, actually using the East Asian Australasian flyway. So uh, along the right hand side here, the Eastern, Eastern route. While we also have uh, some of the birds actually using the Central Asian flyway down the middle here, as you can see flying over the Himalayas. So our studies actually illustrated that these birds have are take, using uh, two different paths uh, uh, to fly between the breeding and wintering grounds uh, all the way back to Singapore. Yep, and also, uh, as I've touched on earlier, also employ modeling techniques. So one, one more example of this is the agent-based modeling. So this simulates the actions and interaction, interactions of different individuals uh, in the ecosystem so that we can uh, better understand wider trends uh, in our environment. So for instance, uh, predictive modeling have, has allowed us to find out more about uh, uh, different movements within our marine environment. So as you can see, highlighted in the top right. So Sisters Island, uh, we found out that Sisters Island is actually an uh, important source and sink habitat uh, in our southern, southern islands. So it's an important stepping stone for, uh, let's say, our coral larvae to, to, to move between uh, different types of islands. So, so for example, uh, like Pulau Pawa and Pulau Sanang here and, uh, and Kusu Island. So Sisters Island is actually an important connection point between uh, these islands. And there's a quick animation that shows the cumulative densities of coral larvae uh, within our water column uh, for two weeks, over two weeks. So this shows how the currents are actually bringing uh, these coral larvae uh, to different parts uh, of our islands or different parts of our water offshore islands in Singapore. Okay, next we also have the least resistance pathway. So there's a type of uh, modeling that actually maps out uh, the paths that animals uh, might use might prefer when moving through our landscape. So it includes variables such as uh, energy and expenditure, or maybe the time spent, or maybe it takes into account different types of roads uh, that are in uh, the landscape, which may uh, hinder their movement. So this allows us to map out uh, animal movement in Singapore for, for fauna such as the Sunda pangolin. So it allows us to tell... Uh, to find out which routes they might use. And then we can actually use this uh, to focus on the different, focus on conserving uh, important pathways that they might prefer to use so that we can uh, safeguard uh, these species. Another aspect of this least uh, resistance pathway modeling uh, is to identify broad ecological corridors, uh, such as the Clemente Nature Corridors can see here highlighted in red. So this allows us to uh, prioritize different areas to conserve uh, as our parks, uh, nature parks, or maybe park connectors or nature ways so that we can secure these uh, important corridors uh, for flora and fauna to move uh, and disperse uh, between different core habitats. Next, another aspect of this pathway modeling is to uh, help model human wildlife conflict 
So a case example of this will be the Samba deer, as you can see here. Uh, so by mapping out uh, the areas that Samba deer is most likely uh, to be present in, we can actually uh, prevent uh, or minimize human wildlife conflicts uh, by uh, focusing on these conflict zones, like for instance here, uh, at the top of this uh, of the map, uh, and close off these areas via fencing to prevent uh, any conflict with vehicles or humans. Last, we also have uh, monitoring uh, systems such as the roadway animal detection system. So this is really important uh, for us and upcoming technology. So it allows us to detect uh, any animals that might be crossing the road. Uh, and these CCTV cameras will pick it up and then it will flash uh, lights on uh, towards uh, oncoming motorists to warn them about animals crossing the road. So this actually helps to reduce, uh, greatly reduce animal road kill on our roads. And quiz time. So uh, same as before, uh, you can type your answer in the Zoom chat and the person with the fastest fingers uh, will win a prize, the uh, seed packets. So name two different types of uh, animals uh, that NPOX has detected on camera traps uh, as part of our part of steam monitoring efforts. So you can put it in the chat and I'll uh, try to look through the answers. Let me see. Okay, I got a answer from Joash. Uh, so he's Joash. So he got Raffles, Bandit, Langer, and Slow Oris. That's correct. And we also have uh, some answers. Uh, somebody, uh, Sunda Pangolin. Uh, we have one answer from Lucy uh, who said uh, Sunda Pangolin and the Sambadia. So that's correct. Uh, congrats to two of you. Uh, we'll contact you again after the, the presentation uh, for you to retrieve your prizes. All right. Okay, let me move on. Oh yeah. Uh, I think Shaozi, I can uh, hand the time over to you. Yep. Thanks, Dylan. Thanks very much to both Dylan and Jerez for for sharing with us such a holistic overview of how MPAS is actually applying science and technology across many different fields, including management of biodiversity, trees in our parks, so many of them, over 6 million in Singapore, as well as the various parks and gardens that M Parks manages as well. So now I'd like to move on to uh, the very last segment. So thank you for staying with us um, through this program. We're a little bit overrun, so we only have time for a few questions. So we've been collecting questions from the audience, and now we'll be um, asking our presenters uh, the various questions so that they can help to address and provide some answers. So the first question uh, would be directed to Jibes. So the first question from our audience is, how do you inspect the condition of a tree and provide quick solutions to keep it healthy? So Jibes, maybe you can just verbalize um, and help um, provide the answer to this question. Right, yeah, thanks Shaoqi for that question and thanks to uh, our audience member who asked that question. So two, two parts to the question. The first one is uh, how we inspect trees, right? I will keep my answer short because I realize that if I go into depth for the answer, it's, everyone's going to have to skip lunch <laughs> to be able to uh, understand this fully. In fact, our certified arborists in MPAX uh, actually go through an entire uh, month-long course, right, just to get themselves certified to be an arborist to inspect trees. Um, but when it comes to inspecting trees, a couple of things. Firstly, you want to do it in a systematic manner. So you want to do it, you know, firstly, you know, inspecting the crown of the tree, the leaves, full down to the branches, the peripheral, the peripheral branches, to the key structural branches, to the trunk, and then to the roots, and then the side context where the tree is. So that's firstly one thing that you want to do when inspecting a tree. So helpful to keep that in mind. Secondly, when you're inspecting a tree, there are two main things they are looking out for. The first one is the health of the tree, like you rightly pointed out, right? So when a tree is unhealthy, you might see that, you know, it might have some, you know, disease on its leaves. Uh, you might see that uh, the leaves are turning yellow. That could be a sign of nutrient deficiency or that could be a sign of stress. The tree might be defoliated as well. So that indicates some kind of physiological stress. And so that will help you to detect, right, the tree is unhealthy. So you want to keep up for these signs and symptoms. But it's another aspect of a tree as well that you want to be mindful of when you're inspecting a tree. And that is uh, the stability uh, of a tree. Because if you understand tree biology, uh, the living tissues of the tree 
tree really are on the outer side of the tree, right? And the leaves as well. Uh, but the internal condition of the tree, which is wood, which is essentially dead cells, actually plays a very important part for the stability of the tree as well. And so you want to be looking out for symptoms like is there a cavity, for example, in a tree? So the tree could be perfectly healthy, but you've got a cavity that compromises the structural integrity and stability of the tree. So you want to be keeping a lookout for these things as well. Um, so, so in a nutshell, um, health and stability and inspecting trees in a systematic manner. Uh, you can probably find more resources online uh, if you go to Mpax's Trees SG website, uh, or if you search out you know, um, resources on arboriculture, you can probably find out some of this uh, information too. Uh, and of course, you can get yourself certified as an arborist or hire a certified arborist to inspect your tree uh, as well, which is often helpful because these are trained professionals that know what exactly they're looking out for and have the right tools to inspect uh, your tree in a thorough and systematic manner too. Uh, the second part to that question is uh, quick solutions to keep your tree healthy. Um, first and foremost, you want your tree to be growing in a location that is suitable for the tree. So sufficient rooting space, you don't want to be growing a large tree in a very confined space because that limits the amount of nutrients, nutrition, water that you can get. Uh, you want uh, the, 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 the tree to be growing in the right, con right, 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 right light conditions, microclimate conditions as well. So certain trees love the sun, uh, love to be growing and exposed and full sun conditions. Certain trees love the shade and will wilt immediately if you put them out in the sun. So it's important to know what species of trees you're taking care of so that you can position them, plant them in the right place. Uh, second part to that also is that you want to make sure your trees are uh, obviously watered frequently enough. You want to make sure that your trees are fertilized uh, sufficiently as well. Uh, when your trees are healthy, they are less likely to be susceptible to diseases, pests, pathogens. Uh, and, 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 and so keeping them well fertilized and well watered and going in the right conditions are, you know, some of these key ingredients uh, to making sure that your tree remains healthy uh, for a long time. So yes, that's my answer to the question. Thank you very much, Jibri. So next time when you go along the streets and you see some people hang around the tree, now you know what they're doing. They're actually inspecting the health as well as the stability of the tree. Thank you very much, Jibri. Okay. So the next question uh, would be directed to Dylan. So the question is, how can members of the public like us contribute um, in terms of um, science and technology as well as biodiversity management. So maybe Dylan, you can help to address the audience's query. Mm, yeah, yeah, thanks a lot for the question. I think it's a great question. So I think uh, how members of the public can contribute, uh, as mentioned, of one of the outreach programs that we have is the biodiversity watches uh, in community in nature. So these, uh, by contributing and taking part in these surveys, uh, you're actually contributing to citizen science and a lot of this data is really important for us uh, to better understand the trends of uh, the animals uh, in Singapore. So for instance, we have the Garden Bird Watch and we actually published, recently published a book, a uh, review of Garden Bird Watch uh, data uh, between 2015 and 2019. So this data actually helps us to keep track uh, of local populations of birds and allows us to better understand their trends uh, so that we can uh, maybe focus our conservation efforts on species that might be declining uh, or getting rarer in Singapore. So I think this is how, uh, uh, this is just one of the ways that you can contribute. Uh. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go too, too long for this, but yeah, I think this is just one of the ways that you can contribute uh, through the surveys. Uh. Thank you very much, Dylan. So yeah, it's really good to hear that we actually have um, a lot of different programs. Besides Garden Bird Watch, we also have um, biodiversity watches for different types of animals, such as butterflies, as well as herons, if you like water birds. So uh, do look out for those. And also um, you can always uh, approach NPARCS um, to ask how you can sign up for these programs. So we have time just for one last question. So the question from our audience uh, is, does NPARCS have an app that we can download to search for the names and of the trees and plants found in Singapore? Maybe um, Gervais can take this question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So maybe let me list uh, two key online resources that I think that would be helpful for you. The first one is called Flora and Fauna Web. So the short form for that is FFW. We'll, we'll get these links in the, in, in the chat later, don't worry. So you can easily search for them. But the first one is Flora Fauna Web. That essentially is a, uh, a pretty extensive list uh, of uh, plant as well as animal species that you can find uh, in Singapore. And then it provides you with information. So for plants, for example, it provides you with not just a technical information, the name, where it comes from, you know, but it provides you with information such as, you know, uh, the growing conditions of that particular tree. So if you're interested in growing a certain kind of plant uh, or certain kind of tree, uh, that's often a helpful resource. Uh, the second resource that I find quite helpful also, especially when it comes to plant identification, if you are a beginner, 
uh, and actually specifically tree identification if you are a beginner if you are a beginner it's actually our trees sg website so again we'll get that link down uh, in the chat uh, trees sg is helpful as an identification tool because it's like google maps right you can take out the map you can be standing next to a tree and you're like oh what tree is this let me find it on the map you can take out the map geolocate yourself brings you right to where you are uh, where, where, where the tree is in the map and then you can just click on the tree and then it tells you what this particular species is so you can actually use this tool right now like when you head out for lunch later uh, stop by a tree try to drill okay yourself see if you can actually uh, identify the tree that you're standing next to and find out what species it is so yeah two 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 pretty cool tools that you can use Thanks very much, Jeremy. So um, thank you very much to our audience for staying with us um, throughout these, this webinar and also for the um, very uh, good questions that have been posed to our two presenters. So we've come to the end of our today's webinar and we would really appreciate if you could take time to help us complete a short survey um, to just let us know how we did for today's webinar. So um, you can scan the QR code um, shown on the screen or also access the link via the chat. So we really, once again, thank you for joining us today um, on this Saturday morning, and we really look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Also, do stay, continue to stay connected with MPARPS through our various social media platforms, such as Facebook, YouTube, um, Twitter, and we also have TikTok as well. So um, do continue to connect with us, and we look forward to seeing you guys again. Thank you very much.